Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing fraction fields. Okay, so we've now successfully uh, defined an equivalence relation on our set of all fractions. And what we now want to do is use this equivalence relation to partition up our set of fractions. Okay, so let's go over the page and I'll now explain to you how you can use an equivalence relation to partition up a set. Okay, so we'll be working with our specific example of our set of fractions here. So let's have our set of fractions displayed here, capital S. Okay, so this contains absolutely all fractions where the numerator is an element of our initial integral domain and the denominator is an element or initial of our initial integral domain, but it cannot be the additive identity within our integral domain. Okay, right. Uh, so now... Uh, Let's try and understand how we can use this equivalence relation that we've defined on the set capital S to partition up uh, the set into equivalence classes, or these subsets of equivalent fractions. Okay, right, so let's take some fraction in our set here. So let's take the fraction A over B here, and now what I'm going to do is generate its equivalence class within the set capital S, and that's going to be the subset of fractions in the set capital S which are related to A over B. Okay, so I'm going to take the subset of all fractions that are related to A over B. Now the first thing is to, and we'll call this the equivalence class, uh, are generated by A over B. Now the first thing to say is that the equivalence class generated by A over B, which I'm now circling in green here, is absolutely always going to contain A over B itself, because as we know, any uh, fraction will be related to itself because an equivalence relation is reflexive. Okay, so A over B will be in its own equivalence class. Okay, but there might be loads of other fractions in here as well, so let's draw another one here, a prime over b prime, which is also in the equivalence class with a over b. Okay, and we'll call this equivalence class, uh, which contains the fraction a over b, a over b bar, okay, so I've taken a over b here and stuck a bar over it, and that now means the equivalence class that contains a over b. Now, uh, the first thing that I want to show you then is that the axioms of an equivalence relation actually mean that if you took any other fraction that is in the equivalence class uh, containing A over B, uh, then if you generated its equivalence class, it would generate the exact same subset. So what I mean by this is if I look at A prime over B prime bars, so if I generate the equivalence class of A prime over B prime, you'll generate the exact same subset here. Okay, so these equivalence classes are exactly equal to one another, and you can just start a thinking about this as the equivalence class containing this and the equivalence class containing this rather than the equivalence class generated by this. Okay, yes, you could use it as a generator if you liked, but you could use any other element in the equivalence class to generate the same subset as well. Okay, so in fact, if you want to name this equivalence class, you could name it by any of the things that are in it because they'd all generate it. Okay, so how can I show this? Okay, why is it going to be the case that if we've got A prime over B prime, which is in the equivalence class of A over B, that if we generate its equivalence class, it's going to be the exact same subset? Well, the first thing to say is that obviously A prime over B prime will be in its own equivalence class, and also that A over B will be in the equivalence class of A prime over B prime because um, of the symmetry in the equivalence relation. If A over B is related to A prime over B prime, then A prime over B prime is related to A over over B. Okay, that's the symmetry of the equivalence relation. Now, furthermore, if I've got any other element that's in this equivalence class of A over B, then it's also going to be in the equivalence class of A prime over B prime. The reason being is that if this element is in the equivalence class of A over B, then it will be related to A over B. And we know that A prime over B prime is related to A over B. So if A prime over B prime is related to A over B, and A over B is related to this other element here, and that's for the want of giving it a name, call it A double prime over B double prime here. Okay, so if uh, A over B is related to A double prime over B double prime, which it must be if this is going to be in the equivalence class of A over B, then we know by transitivity that A prime over B prime must be related to A uh, double prime over B double prime. So effectively what I've said there is 
we know that a prime over b prime is related to a over b, okay, if there's some other element that's in the equivalence class generated by a over b, then uh, a over b will be related to that element a double prime over b double prime, and then by transitivity this implies that a prime over b prime will be related to a double prime over b double prime, and therefore all the elements that are in the same equivalence class as a over b will also be in the equivalence class of a prime over b prime, where a prime over b prime is an arbitrary other element in the equivalence class of a over b. Now, uh, the last thing that I need to show then is that there isn't some element outside of the equivalence class generated by A over B that is in the equivalence class of A prime over B prime. And the reason that's not going to be true is that if there was, it would be the case that A prime over B prime was related to that element. And let's call that element C over D here. Okay, now, and let me just write this out. So. What I want to prove is that this is not allowed. So let's say we've got some a prime over b prime, which is related to some c over d. Okay, but I'm assuming c over d isn't in the equivalence class of a over b. But that would violate transitivity because, of course, I know that a over b is related to a prime over b prime. So if this one's related to this one, and this one's related to this one, then it would imply that this one's related to this one. Okay, so it would imply that c over d would have to have been in the equivalence class of a over b. Okay, so what I've now successfully shown you then is that if I take another element in the equivalence class of a over b, so this a prime over b prime, and, gen and generate its equivalence class, it must contain all of the elements that are in the equivalence class of A over B, and it can't contain elements that are outside of the equivalence class of A over B. So it must generate the exact same equivalence class as A over B. Okay, and since this was an arbitrary other element in that equivalence class, we can conclude that any other element in the equivalence class of A over B uh, would generate the exact same equivalence class. So that's why we insist on transitivity, reflexivity, and symmetry. We've now seen all of them now in play here, okay? Uh, and they are meaning that we can create these equivalence classes that are completely self-contained in this way, because any element you take from that equivalence class, if you generate its equivalence class, it will generate the exact same subset, okay? So reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity, they create that structure. They mean that uh, you take any element in an equivalence class and it will generate you that equivalence class. Okay, and that's why we're going to be able to use this to make a well-defined partition of our set capital S here. Okay, now, so the equivalence class that contains A over B, either it covers the entire set capital S, okay, in which case it's a very boring partition because you've only got one great big subset making up the entire thing, or there is an element C over D here that is outside of that equivalence class. Okay, what we can then do is generate its equivalence class. Okay, so I'll draw this here. So we'll then create the equivalence class of C over D. So I'll put C over D bar here. Okay. Oh, and I want to just stress one more thing about the notation. Because of the fact that it really does not matter which element you use to generate an equivalence class, it means that the nomenclature is somewhat, um, well, it's somewhat ambiguous, because you could use whichever element you like from this equivalence class to actually notate this equivalence class. So you just take some representative and put a bar over it, and that's the name uh, that you use for an equivalence class. That's the notation we're going to use anyway. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're generating another equivalence class that's outside of this one, okay? And my claim is that when you generate the equivalence class of C over D, of course it's going to obey the exact same thing as this one, that all the elements are going to generate the exact same equivalence class, but the other thing that I want to show you is that no element in this equivalence class is going to also be in this equivalence class, okay? So nothing that's in the equivalence class of C over D will be in the equivalence class of A over B, okay? And the reason for this is, let's suppose that A prime over B prime, which is in the equivalence class of A over B, is in the equivalence class of C over D. So that would mean that C over D was related to A prime over B prime, okay? But that's utter rubbish, of course, because we know symmetry has to obey, uh, okay? So this would imply, therefore, that A prime over B prime was equivalent to C over D, 
Okay, but that would mean that C over D was in the equivalence class of A prime over B prime, which would mean that it was in the green equivalence class. So basically, when I generate the equivalence class of some fraction that's outside of the equivalence class that I've already generated, it must be completely distinct from the initial equivalence class. So these must have no intersection at all, basically. They must have empty intersection. And then what you can do is you can continue this on, so you can say, okay, either these two covers cover together the entire set capital S, so they union together to give the entire set capital S, or, again, there is some element, let's have E over F now, uh, which is outside of both of them this time, and then you can generate its equivalence class here. And again, as far as the picture is concerned, that looks to be the final equivalence class, but in reality you'll probably end up with far more than that, okay? And again, uh, for the same argument that we've just applied, this equivalence class will be completely distinct from the two previous equivalence classes. Otherwise, we'll be able to prove that this element E over F was in one of these equivalence classes, and that would be a contradiction. Okay, so this is why you can form this beautiful partition of the set capital S once you've got an equivalence relation defined on a set. So you define your equivalence relation that obeys reflexivity, uh, symmetry, and transitivity, and then you can use this to break up the set into these subsets of all elements that are equivalent to one another, these equivalence classes as they're called, okay, and this is going to form a well-defined partition. It's going to be a bunch of non-overlapping subsets which cover the entire set, and what do I mean by well-defined? I mean that if you hand someone a set and an equivalence relation on that set, uh, and you give it the job to two people to go away and partition the set into two, in, into, you know, subsets, they will both come back to you with the exact same partition. Okay, there's only one way to partition up a set once you've got an equivalence relation defined. Okay, and that's really because all of the elements in an equivalence class would generate the exact same equivalence class, so it really does not matter which representatives you actually use to generate those equivalence classes. Okay, so that's what I mean by well-defined. Two di two different people using different representatives to actually generate the equivalence classes would come back with the exact same overall partition. Okay, right. So, we have now successfully then partitioned up the set of all fractions where the de numerator and denominator are elements of our integral domain into these equivalence classes, these subsets of all fractions that are equivalent to one another, and we know that the equivalence relation that we've defined is the exact relation that we want to intuitively have. We've now grouped together fractions that are equivalent to one another, fractions that we don't want to be considered as separate. Okay, fractions where it is true that A times B prime is equal to B times A prime. Okay, those are fractions that we do not want to be considered separate. Okay, so now our fraction field then capital F is going to be the set of equivalence classes. So as far as this picture is concerned, what you do is put in the green subset, the orange subset, and the red subset. Or you could come up with names for them. Okay, so either you can think about actually putting in the subset, so you could think about it this way, that the elements of our fraction field are going to be these subsets. So in this case, you'd have these three subsets, like so, of equivalent fractions. You'd have the green equivalence class here, you'd have the orange equivalence class here, and you'd have the red equivalence class here. Okay, so either you can actually think about the elements of your fraction field as being the equivalence classes, these subsets of the set of all fractions, or you can think about giving them names, giving them symbols to represent them. So you could represent this by the symbol A over B bar, the equivalence class containing the fraction A over B. You could represent this one as C over D bar, the equivalence class containing C over D, and you can represent this one as E over F bar, the equivalence class containing E over F. Okay, and this is the set that we are actually going to use to build our fraction field. So we're going to define an algebraic structure on this. We're going to define addition and multiplication, and amazingly, it's going to obey um, the axioms of field theory. And even better, we will be able to find a very natural injective homomorphism from the initial integral domain capital D into this fraction field, which we'll do later on.
Okay, so these are the elements of the fraction field to be. These entire equivalence classes of fractions, not the individual fractions. So the elements within the fraction field are considerably more complicated than just being uh, fractions. Instead, they are whole equivalence classes of fractions. Okay, so it is considerably more complicated. And what we're now going to do in the next video is define addition and multiplication on this set of equivalence classes of fractions.